turn with me in your Bible to so 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we will be looking at the first 13 verses. As you're turning there, I will open us in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, um, for the gospel. We thank you for hope, Lord. We thank you that we get to worship you. We, I thank you, Lord, we get to gather together and be together in this place, Lord. And Lord, I pray as we continue to worship you, I pray, Lord, by, as we worship you through looking at your word together, I pray, Lord, that um, you would uh, um, speak through me, and I pray that you speak your words, Lord. I pray, Lord, that I would be a good um, servant, rightly inviting the word of truth. Holy Spirit, lead, guide, and direct um, our time this morning and illumine our hearts so you can apply the eternal word of truth to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this past week was another big big week in our nation. We've had a few of those lately, haven't we? A few big weeks. We have another uh, pres- another administration that has taken, taken over. Um, and it's interesting. By the way, I, I can tell that this pandemic has gone too far because so many people are texting me f- from back home about politics that never have, like my brother, right? People just don't have anything to do. You know, you know, baseball games to go to. So we need to get that squared away soon. But... But I'm sorry if your candidate didn't win, and if your candidate didn't win, congratulations. But I, I still think that doesn't affect us in the kingdom of God. Um, but Hope and I were watching a documentary on Joe Biden after he um, got, a, got um, the inauguration. And um, I was really impressed uh, to, to learn that he was the young, he was, we went from a, a politician who had no political experience to basically one that had the most political experience. He, he was the youngest senator um, to ever be uh, to, have, to ever be inaugurated at one time at 29 years old, and he's now the oldest pre- oldest president to be um, in the Oval Office. So it's kind of interesting. And if you if you've ever seen his life and, and the points between, it's a life uh, of marked with hardship and, and perseverance. Uh, in fact, we were watching watching a, this documentary on PBS, and it was saying that's how he's got through all those problems: perseverance. And you know. Perseverance is, is the key to the Christian walk. It's key. It's key. A good, key, good key for life, and and definitely the Christian walk. Um, Alexander the Great was asked one time how he conquered the world, and he said by not relenting. Perseverance, perseverance. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And last week we were, we were two weeks ago when we looked at First um, Timothy chapter one verses eight to fourteen. We we looked at how. We need to be strengthened, and we need to guard the gospel, guard the deposit that's that God placed within us. And and then in, in verses fifteen to eighteen, which we're skipping, Paul gives three a couple examples of good and bad examples of those who didn't guard the deposit and they walked away from, from the faith. It was it was it was kind of an aside from his his main argument. Well, in these verses he returns to his to the main argument that he was talking about in verses one to thirteen. He encourages Timothy, young Timothy, to persevere in his Christian faith, to persevere in his calling, and to remain loyal to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's writing this to a pastor, but this applies to pastors and applies to Christians, because if you have been reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the call upon you now, as a follower of Jesus Christ, is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who don't know him. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to you need to endure in your gospel witness. See, Paul knew Timothy was young and timid, and he was ministering in a in a very vulnerable place in Ephesus. I mean, if you think that our culture is bad, I mean, this culture is bad. The church in the United States were worried about what if we ever lose our tax exempt status. Well, I can tell you they were far from that in the Roman Empire. It was a bad place. Paul Timothy had been standing against false teachers. Amongst, amongst other things, and he was trying to restore order in the church, and he wasn't having very much success. So here was Paul as he sits in prison himself and reflects on his own life and, he, and the legacies that he's leaving. He gives young Timothy a lesson in faith. He tells Timothy, some, he gives him some important advice on how he can endure for the gospel. And you know, enduring for the gospel and fulfilling your calling, that, that's how you really leave a legacy in this world. And in this passage, Paul gives us five principles for living a life that endures, for living a life that's worth remembering. Four of these five principles 
are are imperative commands in the first ten verses, and the final principle is a promise that we see in verses eleven to thirteen. So four four principles, five principles, four commands, and one promise. First, the first command, he says, "Be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ." Be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. That's literally what he says in verse 1. Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is yours in Jesus Christ. When he says therefore, he's reflecting, he re, he's re, referring back to every, the, the last three commands that he's given. He said, don't be ashamed in, in chapter 1, verse 8. He said, take your share of suffering in, in, um, in chapter 1. And he said, guard the deposit of the gospel. He's referring back to all that. He said, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. Doesn't that sound good to be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ? That, that phrase, be strong, is in the passive voice, and it literally means to, to let yourself be strengthened. And the verb tense means to continually be strengthened by God. It says, be strengthened in grace. You know, it's interesting, in the, in the Greek language, was the, which the New Testament was originally written in, the prepositions work so much different than the English language. And they could be difficult to interpret. And it really has a profound impact on grace. Because sometimes Paul could talk about grace as, as an, instrument, an instrumental sense. Like we're saved by grace, which is true. And we're enabled by grace, which is true. But it's also true that th this same grace is the sphere in which the Christian life is lived. Grace is the, sp is the sphere in, in which we live the Christian life. And that's the... That's the the, 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 the tense he's referring to in this passage. He wants, he wants Timothy to know, he wants to remind him to be strength, to strengthen himself in, 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 the, in the grace that is in Jesus Christ, the grace in which he, he lives in. You know, I watched uh, people storm up the Capitol um, steps a few weeks ago. I, look, I don't know, we can have political debates, but I don't like violence of any kind. I, I'm sure most of you, I hope most of you don't either. I watch people storm up the steps, and they're, they're saying they're doing this for King Jesus and all these Christianese. Let me tell you, someone who's living in the grace that is found in Jesus Christ, you can tell. They behave totally different. Don't, they behave totally different. And all of those things he, 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 he said before, don't be ashamed, take your share in suffering, and guard the deposit of the gospel, is, are to be understood in the context of this more general imperative of of. Allowing yourself to be strengthened in God for the task of ministry by being strengthened in grace that is in Jesus Christ. Do you want your life to have an impact? Do you want to fulfill your calling and to make disciples and to, and to, and to win, win souls for Jesus Christ? If you find yourself desperate for strength this morning, you're in a good place. You're a great candidate for grace. Maybe some of you are dealing with wayward children. Fatigue, depression, discouragement, betrayal, illness, whatever it is, learn to be strengthened in the grace of God. How can you do that? Well, first of all, you can start acting like you're living, you can start living in grace and start behaving like that. Live, fight your spiritual battles as a victor, not as a victim. Spend time every day in prayer and, and talking to God. Take your concerns to him. Take your feelings to him. Meditate on his word. To, to, we need to be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. And, and the, rest of, the rest of the imperatives build from that one. The second, the second command is this. We need to be strong to disciple others. We need to be strong to, to disciple others. Look at verse 2. It says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. He's talking about multiplication here. He's talking about mission. You know, the mission, the mission of our church is very clear. It doesn't matter if I'm here, I'm here or whoever's here. We, the mission of our church is to guide people, individuals, to, to have a closer relationship with God, one disciple at a time, to, to draw people closer to God. Do you, know, do you know what happens to a society that doesn't make disciples? You can watch the news, you'll see. Hey, no one can argue with the fact that the, the less people that are walking as disciples of Jesus Christ in our culture, the, the more depraved that culture becomes. 
You know, the letter of 2 Timothy, it, more than anything, is a changing of the guard. See, Paul knows that this is it. He knows he's going to die. In chapter 4, he says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. So he's, he's talking about passing the torch to Timothy. You know, it's like the Olympic Games. You know, isn't that neat when they, they take the torch? One runner passes it from another. What a great spectacle. One, one person fulfills their duties and then gives it to another person so they can fulfill their duties. And eventually, all the work is completed. That's how the gospel got to us today, all these, all these years later. Paul's telling Timothy that he has finished his turn of carrying the, carrying the torch of the gospel. Now it's Timothy's turn. Now it's his turn for the leg of the race. Now Paul reminds Timothy that if he is, if he is, to, uh, he is to pass the torch, pass this, pass this gospel and to entrust it to faithful men who will then in turn entrust it to other faithful men. I mean, in fact, in this one verse, four generations are mentioned. You, did you ever realize that? First Timothy, or first Paul, then Timothy, then faithful men, and then others. It's a principle of multi multiplication. That's how you reach a world that has, what, 7 billion people by now? I read a good illustration of this. Um, seen in the life of a relatively unknown Sunday school teacher. His name was Edward Kimball. In 1858, as a Sunday school teacher, he led a young man who was in his Sunday school class. The young man worked as a shoe salesman. He led him to give his life to Jesus Christ. This shoe salesman, a young man named Dwight Moody, became an evangelist. About 20 years later, he was in England preaching with evangelistic zeal. It brought revival to a, a, a minister named Frederick Meyer, who, who was pastoring a small church. Meyer was, went, went on preaching to, uh, across American campuses, and he brought a student named Wil Wilbur Chapman to Jesus Christ. Well, Chapman was later preaching and engaged in, in y, work in the YMCA, and he employed a former, a former baseball player named Billy Sunday to do some evangelistic work. Billy Sunday had a great revival in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a group of men were at this revival, and they were so enthusiastic that afterward they, they, they planned another evangelistic campaign in which they invited a, a, a preacher named Mordecai Ham to town to preach. During Ham's revival, a young man named Billy Graham gave his life to Jesus Christ, and thousands and thousands of people have given their souls, given their lives to Christ through his ministry. Only eternity will reveal the tremendous impact that Billy Graham and, and people like him had as they invested their lives in others. So we are to entrust faithful men and women, to entrust them, look for them, to pour ourselves into. We need a, we need to, we need a, a Paul, to, we need to be a Paul, and we need to be a Timothy. We need to receive some from somebody, and we need to pour into somebody else. And you might say, well, how do I find these type of people? Well, it's an acronym, an acronym that I once heard. I, I, I think it's helpful, and it's an acronym FAT. Faithful, available, and teachable. Faithful, available, and teachable. So in order to follow the advice of Paul gives to Timothy, we need to find fat people. And, have, and, and, and teach them so they can in turn teach others. Did you ever think that the, one of the greatest things you could do with your life is to pour into your life into a, a future leader? We, we have a dire need of leaders in the church, both not, not here specifically, but the church by and large. Find them, teach them, and turn them loose. We need to be strong to disciple others. Third, the third command, we need to be strong to persevere through suffering. We need to be strong to persevere through suffering. Do you know that the, one of the number one promises we have as Christians is we are going to suffer? We're going to suffer. I get so I get so frustrated. I see these great ministers, like these guys have big followings. They write all these books. They fall away and they just kind of, they don't want to talk about it. And they, they just make comments like, well, I just can't, I just can't, you know, think a good God would let bad things happen like this to our world and to people. It just makes me think, how long, you've been a pastor for 30 years and you've never come to grips with this? I mean, 
It just amazes me because the number one thing we're promised is suffering. He says in verse 3, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You need to be strengthened, strengthened with the gospel so you can entrust that gospel to others, but, but you, will, you will suffer, Paul says. And Paul wants believers to understand that enduring hardship and suffering is part of, is part of the call of following Jesus Christ. God doesn't promise to protect believers from trouble. No, he promises to, to per, help you persevere through them. And then in verses 3 through 7, he gives us three images of what it looks like to endure hardship. The first is a, is a dedicated soldier. Soldiers have a, have a priority. They're dedicated to, to what they do. It says, no, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may, but, but that he may please him who has enlisted him as a soldier. Do you know a child of God is, a, is you are, as a child of God, you are a soldier? How so? Well, if you remember in the last chapter of Ephesians, it talks about this. It says that the, the battle we're fighting is a spiritual battle. So it says we need to put on the form of God. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Where, therefore, take up, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. A soldier is to endure hardship and not get entangled with the lesser affairs of this world. Do you know one of the number one the devices that the devil has is distractions? Distractions, that's what the devil wants. He wants your attention more than anything else. Well, a soldier doesn't let that happen. Tertullian, uh, one of the early, early church fathers, said in his uh, address to martyrs, and what a title, by the way, <laughs> it says, no soldier, no, one, no soldier comes to war surrounded by luxuries, nor goes into action from a comfortable bedroom, but from a makeshift narrow tent where every kind of hardness and severity and unpleasantness is, is to be found. We, are to, we are, to, are to endure as a dedicated soldier. Second, endure as a, as a disciplined athlete. Endure as a disciplined athlete. It says, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Competes re refer, refers to contending for the game. He wants to win. He wants to do everything that he can to be a winner. You know, you know good athletes, they're not deterred from their goal. People get awful competitive, and they, they, so much so that they won't play by the rules. It says we must play by the rules. They try to take shortcuts and, and take their shortcut way to the top. Now, one, one author said this about Christians. It says, the only exercise some Christians get is jumping to conclusions, running down their friends, sidestepping responsibility, or pushing their luck. That's not the type of exercise that Paul is talking about here. He's talking about a racetrack, talking about enduring. He says in Philippians that I press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God that's in Christ Jesus. In, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he said he wanted to keep his body under control so he can run the race well. You know, it's interesting. I, it's always interesting for me to see athletes that have so much talent that they don't, take, they don't, and they don't think they need to practice or take care of themselves. I remember when, um, uh, when, when the Steelers first drafted their quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger, years ago. He was riding down through Pittsburgh on a, one of the fastest motorcycles in the world without a helmet, right? I mean, you think that if you were really cared about what you were doing, you would try to try to compete so that you could win. You'd be dedicated and, and try to not only not, not be reckless, but control, control your body. Paul, Paul's goal was to run the Christian race in such a way that he could get to the end. So he can, he can get to the end because endurance is the key. It's finishing is the key. He wanted to hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And he competes according to the rules. You know there's no shortcuts in the Christian life. All these gimmicks and formulas and books people write, there's no shortcuts. Just like, just like going through grief. You know the shortest way through grief is right through the middle of it. That's the way it is with the Christian life. There's no shortcuts. If, you're, if you want to win, you can't take shortcuts. An athlete endures hardship in the race in order to run to attain the prize. I used to have friends that would, in, in Pennsylvania in high school, they would sleep in, pla in plastic bags trying to lose weight. I mean, are you kidding me? These guys want to win more than I do. Third, he, we, he, third image he gives us of, of enduring suffering is of a diligent farmer. This speaks of patience. It says, a hardworking farmer 
must first must be the first to partake of the crops. The farmer endures hardship of labor in order to harvest a crop. He's not like the gifted teacher or the, or the victorious athlete or the, de- or the decorated soldier. No, the life of the farmer doesn't involve as much glamour or prestige or recognition. It involves getting up early and staying up late. It involves doing things that, things that go unnoticed, constant toil, regular disappointments, patience, even boredom. And his reward is a share of the harvest. Doesn't seem like much, right? But if that harvest happens to be your children, your grandchildren, your sons, your daughters in ministry or on the mission field, trust me, it'll be more than enough. Pastor once said, the harvest is not the end of the beating. The harvest is the end of the age. You know, sometimes living and living um, and growing as a Christian can seem like hard work. It takes energy, investment, and time. And so does your family and your marriage or anything of real value. But Paul ends this thought in verse 7. He says, consider what I say. And may the Lord give you understanding in all things. This is Bible study 101, by the way. A student, you want to be a student of the Bible, you need to consider what God's word says in order to hope to understand it. And then, then you need to study it with God's promise in view that where he says the Lord will give you understanding in everything. We need to be strong to, perse- to persevere through suffering because suffering will come our way. Don't be blown, blown off course by it. The fourth command, we need to be strong to endure so that others can be saved. We need to be strong to endure so that others can be saved. Verse 8 says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with change as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with, with eternal glory. Paul says, remember Jesus Christ. I mean, you think, how can we ever forget? Well, that's one of the reasons we partake of the Lord's Supper once a month. This text is, it's, it says we need to be reminded both of his divinity and his humanity. He says, remember Jesus Christ, he's, he, who has risen from the dead, which means he's God, by the way. He says, that's why I'm in prison. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm in chains. But he says, you know what? God's word's not chained. So I do everything for the sake of the, sake of the elect. I mean, there's, there's so much here. First of all, Jesus, he speaks of his, his humanity and his divinity. He's risen from the dead, and he's a descendant of David. He's died in our place, risen from the grave, conquered our enemies, and now he sits at God's right hand. And by the way, that means whenever you feel empty, you can remember the tomb is empty. And, and, and he's, the throne is occupied. You know, you can, you can endure lots of things when you have the sufficient motivation and, and, su- and sufficient power. Have a lofty vision of Christ and, 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 and him sitting on God's throne. Paul says his, 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 he says his chains doesn't, the, doesn't, doesn't prevent the gospel from being chained. You know, that's the, God's, word, the, God's word. God's word is not chained. It's powerful. You know, when... Um, 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 when Paul Bunyan wrote the Pilgrim's Progress, um, he was he, he, well, he was he was arrested. He was put in prison. He was facing a wall. The where that's all he could see is this wall. They said he preached every day. He just preached. They couldn't stop him. They said people would gather from all around to hear God's word because you can't change God's word. That's why Martin Luther put the ninety five theses on the door. You can't you can't change God's word. God's word is powerful. Isaiah says that it will not return to God void. It will accomplish everything. That he set it forth to that he, that he set it forth to accomplish. One author said the persecution of, the, of Christian leaders may hamper the progress of the gospel, but it can't imprison the word of God, nor can it pre- prevent its spread. And and Paul says he he he, he suffers his chains all for the sake of the elect. Now you might say, what's the elect? Is that you know, are we predestined? I can tell you we don't have to get into that. I'd be glad to talk about that anytime. But I can tell you one thing: it does mean. It means that, that as, and as Paul saw it this way, that Paul was guaranteed to have ministry success. Because God has, God has elected people. There's, there's a harvest field out there, and Paul knew it. 
There was elect to obtain salvation. Paul was confident of that. And you know, we need to be confident of that too. God has God destined people to, to be saved with the gospel. All we need to do is proclaim it. So we need to, we need to, pers- we need to, pers- we need to be strong so that we can endure so that others can be saved. You know, are people worth it? Your neighbors, your friends? We, that's, that's the only hope for our culture is, is the gospel. It's the only thing that can transform anybody. And you know, transformation, I, I've said this before, is the assumption of me standing up here right now. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that God could transform lives and it's the gospel that does it. And God has destined, has, has an audience for us. All we need to go out there is make contact with them and, and share his word in, in, in whatever ways he's equipped us to. Well, the final principle is in the form of a promise. It says, this is a faithful saying, if we, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we, de- if we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. There's a lot. There's a lot in these verses, and there's a lot that we can we can unpack. But but it, it simply means it's talking about conversion and sanctification, perseverance. Talking about God's judgment, but most of all, it's talking about God's faithfulness. God is faithful. If we die with Him, we shall live with Him. Using the language of Romans six, is symbolically of baptism, conversion, sanctification. If we died with Him, if we've place our faith in Jesus Christ, we will, we will also live with him when we die our, 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 natural, our natural death. If we endure with him, we, through hard times, we will reign with him. This is talking about perseverance. Perseverance. You know, an apple and an apple tree, it gets right by just, by just hanging in there. And that's all we need to do as Christians. We are tapped in to, to the source of eternal life. If we disown him, he will disown us. This is speaking of God's judgment because it's real. Matthew chapter 10 says, if we confess, Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I will also confess you before my heavenly father who is in heaven. Whatever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my father who is in heaven. Now this, now this is referring to people that, a continual rejection of Jesus Christ, just like our speakers uh, were we're talking about last week, a continual rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is what is the only thing that will prevent you from, from being saved. That's what Hebrews is talking about. There's no more sacrifice left for you because Jesus Christ is it. He says, we are faithless because we doubt that he is still faithful. That means God is, God is still faithful. He's faithful to his promise that he will judge us. No matter, no matter where we're at, God will be true to himself. God can't change. That's what these verses are saying. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'll judge the wicked. He'll judge the righteous. He says he cannot disown himself. He's faithful to himself. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about, I was telling Dwayne this before the service. Last week, which I enjoyed our, our speakers last week a great deal. And I was, you know, just thinking about um, uh, just Abortion, it's a, it's a rough topic to talk about. And it just made me think, God is really that holy. But he's really that gracious. He's that gracious too. Like the speakers were saying that if, if women have people around them and they're pregnant, 80% of the time they will keep the child. I mean, it just speaks to me of how gracious our God is. God, God is faithful to himself. He, he, he's perfectly holy and he's, he's full of grace. God keeps his promises. That's why I get, I get so boggled when Christians fall away and persecution happens. That's one thing we're promised. You know, the, the only thing I could speak personally, the only thing I could bank on this world is God is good. And he only, he only wants the very best for me. And he only wants the very best for you. I'm sure of that more than I'm sure of anything. I know that God is good, so I can trust him when times come. He is faithful. Even when we are faithless, he cannot just discern himself. All, all we need to do is endure Paul's giving Timothy five principles for a life worth living. Five principles to endure in your life's calling, to endure in, 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 your, in your ministry, which is to share the gospel with other people through words and without words. Be strong in the grace that is found in Jesus Christ. We need to be strong to disciple others. 
We need to be strong to persevere. And we need to be strong to endure so that others can be saved. And with all of this, we can, we can rest in God's promises. Remember Jesus. Remember who Jesus is. Remember the one who has conquered our enemies and is seated at the right hand of God. Remember the one who gives sufficient grace. If we endure through him, we will reign with him. And that's one thing you need to be sure of. That's one thing that will never change. Our government could change. Our, our, our world could change, but that will never change. When your faith ends with sight, when you see him face to face, your Savior will say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Believers must endure in their gospel witness. If you've been reached for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the call upon your life now as a follower of Jesus Christ is to share that gospel with other people who don't know it. That's how it got to us. You know, if we, if we miss a, one or two generations, that, that could be it. We need to reach our, our, the next generation for Jesus Christ. The Lord expects us to multiply ourselves. Now, as we, let us partake of the Lord's Supper. And as we do, let us remember Jesus as we do this in remembrance of him. Father, we thank you for perseverance, Lord, and we can persevere, Lord. Um, and Lord, I th we can persevere because of the grace that we find in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would teach us how to be strengthened um, with the grace that we find in Jesus Christ, Lord. And I know that, that there's many here that are listening or, or watching online, Lord, that need to do that, Lord. We're, we are going through times like we never have before, and Lord, the truth is a lot of a lot of us are isolated, Lord. We have nothing to do but think about disinformation or negative news or whatever, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would instead use that time to be strengthened in the grace that we find in Jesus Christ, Lord. And teach us, Lord, um, how to find faithful men and faithful women to entrust the gospel with, Lord, and, and to make disciples, Lord, and, and fulfill the, the mission of our lives and the mission of this church, Father. Pray we do that right where we're at in our spheres of influence, Lord. I pray that we would um, uh, persevere in suffering, Lord, knowing that you use it, Lord, for your good and for your glory, Lord. And, and Lord, we thank you, Lord. We pray, Lord, that um, you would bless us, Lord, to be your hands and your feet, Lord, in, in, this, in this watching world, Lord. And I pray, Lord, we, above all, we remember Jesus, Lord, who he is, Lord. He's God and he's human, Lord. And, and Lord, uh, for his sake, Lord, we would... Um, uh, preach, we preach him, Lord, and, and Lord, we would win souls to you, Lord, who you've promised to, to bring to this church and, and, and into your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen.